Um, good afternoon, colleagues and, and friends joining us for the webinar. Um, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to talk to you about one of uh, my favorite topics, something that's very near and dear to, to my heart, which is solving the one-time buyer problem in retail. Quick introduction, uh, my name is Jordan Elkin. I lead the product team here at Costora. Quick overview of what our uh, agenda is for today. We'll start with a reminder of why we're here, <laughs> uh, why have you joined us. Um, chat your questions. Uh, we'll have some opportunity for Q&A at the end, and we'll share the deck and recording. Um, as far as an agenda for today, we'll start with a deep dive into the problem statement. Um, we have kind of a, a jokey title, which is that a one-time buyer is everyone's problem, but at the root of it is, is a real challenge that we've observed working with hundreds of retailers um, in different sectors and verticals and, and sizes, um, which is that too often marketing is saddled with the sole responsibility for solving thorny customer loyalty problems, like churn, VIP cultivation, one-time buyer. Um, and, and in reality, that, that approach doesn't work any longer. We, the, there's an opportunity that we have now to use customer insights to more holistically solve for some of these challenges. We'll go much deeper. Um, number two, we'll walk you through a completely prescriptive data-driven methodology that we've observed, again, from working with hundreds of retailers to uh, work uh, pretty darn effectively at, at uh, mobilizing companies and uh, solving the, the one-time buyer problem in a data-driven way. I think this will become clear as we dive into some of the materials here, but um, for better or for worse, there is no single silver bullet, no piece of technology, data management software, personalization software that will solve the challenge. The one thing that separates the retailers who have been able to make meaningful progress on this challenge from, from those who have struggled um, is all about the, the steps that they follow as an organization, really the, the culture um, uh, in, in those retail organizations. And then, as I mentioned, we'll end with the little Q&A. First, just a bit uh, about who we are at Costora. Costora is a customer intelligence platform that works with retailers to solve some of the biggest customer loyalty challenges. Everything from churn prevention to one-time buyer, recognizing who our VIP customers are, acquiring more of them. Um, the, the types of uh, foundational challenges that are really, in a sense, life and death for retailers as they struggle to reinvent themselves and uh, defend their turf against Amazon in, in the brave new world of retail. We're fortunate to work with some absolutely incredible brands globally, um, and we've learned a lot from them. And it's in that spirit of sharing back best practices that, that we've culled from our collaboration with some of these fine retailers that we bring you this webinar content today. So let's get into the meat of it. One-time buyer is everyone's problem. I would suspect by virtue of the fact that you are on the webinar today, that a lot of this is like preaching to the choir. Um, there are lots of readily available stats, certainly um, patterns that we've recognized in, in our customer base about the uh, tremendous importance of a, a loyal, active, repeat customer base, all of which just puts even more pressure on, on teams to get one-time buyers, those one-and-done customers, over the hump to engaging with the company again. Um, but some of these stats are ones that folks on the phone are probably familiar with. Um, the notion of how much more expensive it is to acquire a new customer than to retain an existing customer, the vastly disproportionate share of value that comes from a, a relatively small sliver of highly engaged customers. To this, I would add maybe a, a more sobering statistic, um, not on the screen, which is that when we look out at our customer base, um, again, across all different industry verticals and sizes, we, we tend to see some pretty um, staggering stats around the uh, prevalence of one-time buyer behavior. In general, we see that about 75% of customers who interact with a brand make one purchase and only one purchase. Um, but another way of putting that, perhaps a, a slightly more dire spin on it, is that the average retailer is actually losing tens of millions of dollars every year by, by virtue of not being able to convert more one-time buyers into loyal repeat customers. Um, I mentioned the 75% stat. Just to um, round out uh, a couple of additional contextual details, 
uh, for why it's so darn hard to be a marketer today. Um, even once we're able to get those one-time buyers over the hump to become repeat customers, it's really hard to hold on to them, right? The average business loses about 25% of its revenue every year to customer attrition, downshifting of high value customers to less frequent um, shopping behavior, perhaps as they drop out of the category or defect for competitors. Um, we, we've run a, a number of webinars on the growing reliance on promotions and how hard it is to, to wean off of discounts. In some of those webinars, we shared some statistics from our research uh, indicating that roughly 50% of DTC sales in the e-commerce space are actually made on promotion or markdown. Again, speaking to the absolute cutthroat uh, challenge associated with, with holding on to customers and getting them to, to make that purchase. So with all that in mind, these being incredibly difficult challenges to solve, um, I'd like to actually open this up to a quick poll. Um, so the last time you bought, putting yourself in the shoes of, of the consumer, um, once and only once from a brand, why did you not go on to buy more? Was it the marketing, the product, the service experience? Um, the resonance of the style or pricing or something else altogether. We'll take a minute to complete the, uh, the survey here. Although unfortunately, Maddie, I'm gonna have to rely on you for some technical backup because I can't see how to launch it. Okay, so it looks like the poll is in progress. Yep, responses just, are coming in. Take just one more minute here. Okay. Maddie, let's wrap up the poll and share the results. Okay, fascinating. Um, so the um, I'm not sure if folks on the webinar are able to actually see the results here. I'll just voice them quickly. Um, far and away, the, the biggest cause of one-time buyer behavior amongst our marketers turned individual consumers uh, on the poll, putting themselves in the shoes of people who bought once and only once, was actually not liking the product. Um, more than a third of respondents, 35%, um, cited that as a, a cause of one-time buyer behavior. Um, pricing and brand resonance the, coming in at number two, customer service at number three, and the uh, relevance and personalization of the marketing actually came in, in last with only 5% of, uh, of respondents citing that. That is very interesting. Interesting to me, and I have to admit, I, I wasn't sure um, what type of response we would get um, since this is the first time that we've actually run this poll. Maddie, can you flip the presenter controls back to me? Sure can. So, I think the um, the poll points to a conundrum that we've been facing for years with the retailers that we work with, which is that customer loyalty just definitionally is supremely multifaceted. Um, of course, as marketers, we tend to think about the relevance and timeliness of post-purchase nurturing. That's kind of the, the lever that we have control over in, in driving repeat buyer conversion. Um, but as we saw, that that is um, not the only, nor is it necessarily the most important determinant of which customers are gonna go on to, to make a second purchase. Um, we have product adoption and product acceptance, fulfillment, customer service, um, pricing. All of these play a role in driving customer loyalty. And so with that in mind, if we were able to design our kind of dream retail organization, what would it look like? Think about this as like the most fighting shape fit organization to solve the one-time buyer problem. First, there would probably be 
some kind of shared visibility into what the one-time buyer rate is. In this cheesy little infographic, our CEO actually knows that the one-time buyer rate is going up month over month and is looking to the team for answers. Now, of course, marketing is coming to the table with new improved forms of personalization, right? So talking about putting the right message in front of one of their personas and um, expanding to different channels. But merchandising is getting in on the game too, looking at which customers are repeating and, and using that to optimize their merchandise assortment, incorporating product feedback in, into their new collection. Finance has a seat at the table, um, uh, looking into promotions, which promotions are, are effectively driving our one to two time buyers. Even our retail and store ops folks are thinking about where we should strategically locate uh, our retail footprint in order to um, maximize the likelihood of new customers coming back to make a second purchase. Now, if the previous slide seems like a, a pipe dream, that's probably because it is. And we um, intentionally created just the most outlandish vision of the future possible. One that we think about often, but is unfortunately quite different from the reality that we see day to day in, in different organizations. And uh, frankly, uh, on the Kasura product team, we've been um, diving deep into this problem over the past year. What is it that is holding every retailer back from looking like the, the, the vision of the future that we saw before? Why are different teams not collaborating to solve these absolutely mission critical business challenges like the one-time buyer problem, uh, taking action in, in concert to address those uh, uh, aspects of customer experience that go well beyond marketing. And we've kind of narrowed it down to three hypotheses. Number one, it, it is very rarely the case in, in our experience that we see a retailer where there's a single source of insights across every team and every channel. Now, um, uh, many folks on the, the webinar have probably heard the, the term single source of truth, single source of data, just being absolutely abused by vendors like Kasura. Um, it, it's a pretty cheap marketing buzzword. and um, I think a single source of data is interesting because one thing that we've discovered is just having the same data isn't enough, not by a long shot. Even once different teams are able to stitch together their data to create the, the coveted single customer view, the 360 degree view of the customer, uh, we need to go well beyond that, right? We need to have visibility across all teams into who these customers are, or what makes them tick. In the previous example, we were talking about uh, repeat rates by certain personas of customers um, or by uh, different types of promotional inclination. So really being able to understand um, uh, who customers are beyond just having the raw data. And additionally, um, having every team operating off of the same KPIs. Um, so how do we measure one to two time buyer conversion? And is the display team using the same single source of reporting or customer KPI truth as the merchandising team. Secondly, a, a big hurdle that we've seen is that there's often uh, alignment lacking across teams around specific initiatives. So even if we have um, fantastic enriched customer profiles that every team is accessing, there are um, stats uh, around customer loyalty that are common across the company. There, there can often be, even at the highest level of leadership, some real disagreement around what problems we should be trying to solve as a business. Are we acquiring and retaining millennials? Are we focused on driving adoption of our new subscription product or private label credit card? Uh, are we focused on our one-time buyer problem? And if so, which segment or segments of customers are, are we looking at? This is more a prioritization, getting every team kind of operating off of, off of the same page. And then lastly, um, one thing that we've had the great opportunity to work with the retailers to, to help them with is what we would see as knowing what to do with the insights. Um, so when we see that certain segments of customers are falling off in terms of their one to two time buyer uh, conversion rate, what are the best practices in the industry? Um, how do we get merchandising and financing, all these teams that feel a world away from marketing involved in uh, unifying to, to solve the one to two time buyer problem? So with that as the backdrop, um, I, I, I don't wanna paint a bleak picture. On the contrary, I actually, want to let you all know that there is a, a repeatable process that we've discovered from working with some of these great retailers founded on, on closing some of these gaps so spreading the same insights across all teams driving alignment and, and then leveraging expertise that lives across the company and through external partners um, and it, it's not that complicated 
generally speaking, the most effective organizations that we see, the ones that are able to really accelerate quickly into solving problems like one-time buyer, um, follow a, a four-step dozy dough. First, they start by mobilizing their organization around a, a common understanding of the business problem, actually being able to um, quantify the size of the prize and, and set goals around where they want to steer the ship. Secondly, they go from insight to, to strategy. Um, and uh, these are teams that, as uh, you know, from setting goals, they, they often realize, hey, we have a $5 million problem. The initial instinct is always to jump in and start executing. But these teams take a step back and, and try to focus on root causing and putting in place a coherent action plan. Thirdly, they uh, execute vigorously and with an experimentation mindset. We'll talk through some examples of this. Um, I, I would bet that this resonates with some of the folks on, on the phone. Uh, and lastly, they have an obsessive culture around measurement and optimization. All this probably seems very consulting, buzzwordy. So I thought we could walk through step-by-step um, -step what this looks like for some of the, the most successful organizations that Kosoro works with and actually share some, some case studies um, for what it looks like in practice. We'll start with organizational mobilization. Um, and we think of this initial step really as prioritizing opportunities and setting goals. Um, we've been uh, focusing a bunch on how to better provide this kind of functionality within Castora out of the box um, because we've seen that it's so very helpful for retailers. Um, but broadly speaking, step one is to uh, quantify the, the, that we're looking to capture. So if we're focused on one to two time buyer rate, arrive at a common company definition of what that looks like. We'll do some polling later on to see what you folks are using. Um, uh, if it's churn, again, um, leverage uh, kind of standard industry definitions or your own in-house expertise to arrive at a common KPI. Then do some scenario planning. So if you have access to um, uh, benchmarks from peer retailers, or if you have a relationship with an external partner like Kasora that works with a variety of retailers, this is something that I, th I think it's reasonable to expect of the partners that you're working with. So let's say that your organization um, aligns around a, a definition of one to two time uh, buyer behavior. You see that you're currently at 10%, um, but you know that the benchmark for your industry is 15%. How much does that actually equate to as kind of lost opportunity for your business every year? As fundamental as, uh, and straightforward as this sounds, we find that this is a step that many retailers kind of skip by, and it, it makes it more difficult, especially at the highest level of leadership, to figure out where to prioritize and, and where to focus. Secondly, um, uh, setting goals. It um, should come as no surprise since marketers tend to be very goal-oriented, uh, basically optimizing everything from awareness to conversion. Um, but the, the only teams that succeed in meaningfully making progress against problems like one-time buyer are, are the ones that set realistic but, but stretch goals and actually socialize those goals throughout the company. We've worked with um, retailers in the past that have gone so far as to um, put up kind of uh, dashboards in the elevator and the main floor of, of their operations showing progress against their one to two time buyer goal. Um, and again, as, as cheesy as, uh, as this might sound and, and as simple, this is a, a step that any organization can undertake. Um, it's important when setting goals to be mindful of both what the standard is for your industry. So in the previous example, we talked about, hey, we're at 10%, industry is at 15%. That might provide kind of the upper aspirational limit for where we want to go, but factoring in your organization's own unique constraints. So, hey, we know that our creative team is extremely strapped and, and we can't uh, operate as nimbly as we'd like, or you know, our ultimate goal is to loop in our cross-functional partners from merchandising and finance to help out, but really marketing is being tasked with proving the value first. So we're gonna set a goal that's a little bit more modest um, rather than more stretch. Second um, piece of the puzzle here, once we've understood how big of, of an opportunity is, how much money we're leaving on the table, and set a realistic but attainable goal is all around strategy formulation. So really getting to the root cause of, of why we're seeing this one to two time buyer challenge. One framework that we've found to be really helpful um, as we're working with our clients to, to help them um, 
detect leading indicators of one to two time buyer challenges and, and put in place an, an actionable plan to close that gap is a persona analysis. Now, you don't have to work with a fancy predictive analytics retailer like Castora in order to run um, some clustering analysis on your customer base. The goal is to essentially understand who are similar groups of customers based on um, behavior, demographics, propensity, attitude in, in some cases. What we're showing here is kind of a, an example of what this might look like for your organization. Um, let's say that your team undertakes an effort to uh, dig into who your customers are and, and you run some historical analysis based on um, customer affinity. So looking for groups of customers who, who tend to buy similar products. Um, that would actually enable us to create pretty rich profiles of who these different customers are. It provides us with a lens through which to understand what's the value of acquiring, let's say, a head-to-toe fashion shopper versus an accessories junkie. It gives us a sense of what their typical discount behavior is. Heck, we've worked with retailers, especially over the past six months, who have gone a step further and have actually brought in qualitative data to further enrich and make sense of who these customers are. Um, so we worked with a retailer recently who ran some, some surveys through Qualtrics um, and, and we're actually able to tease out uh, what the core value proposition of their brand was to these different behavioral uh, profiles. Um, so an example using the head-to-toe fashionista and accessories junkie would be maybe for our head-to-toe fashionista convenience and the, a well-curated collection or, or the things that keep them coming back. Whereas for our accessories junkies, um, newness, um, and, and unique finds that they can't get anywhere else are, are the things that keep them coming back. But this, this is a really, really important tool um, in, in the tool belt for especially the marketing team as we think about root causing and, and formulating strategy around one to two time buyers. I'm gonna highlight two ways in which it's helpful and important. When we work with our clients in, in retail, thinking about strategy, we often use a, a framework like this. Um, perhaps you've leveraged similar kind of decision frameworks in your own organizations. Um, to think about the trade-off between level of effort involved in implementing a, a one to two time buyer conversion strategy versus the ultimate payoff. Maybe another way of thinking about this would be kind of more reactive tactical fixes, what we call reducing the, the flooding, versus a more proactive um, dam construction. So how do we, um, uh, build a stronger value proposition for our, our different customer segments over the long run. I'm going to take a quick break before we get into um, talking about the difference between reducing the flooding and constructing the dams and turn this over to uh, folks in the audience. So, Mehdi, if you wouldn't mind firing up the poll, I'd love to learn how some of the folks in, in our audience are, are currently thinking about curating a, an experience for new customers. Typically, we hear this described as like a post-purchase welcome series. Um, there are a couple of options on the screen. Um, I, I'm not going to read them out, but would love for you folks to take, let's say, 30 seconds and give us the best approximation of how your organization approaches the customer experience post-initial purchase. Ten more seconds, last responses rolling in. Okay, awesome. Let's close it. Maddie, if you don't mind sharing the um, the output from the poll. Okay, so um, really interesting stuff here. Um, it looks like far and away, the vast majority of folks um, are doing some A-B testing of their welcome series, which is fantastic. Um, we're, we're huge proponents of experimentation and, and testing. Um, what this means in, in layman's terms for those who aren't currently using this is um, a, a new customer makes her first purchase. She'll get kind of randomly assigned to one of two or, or more potential tracks. It could be a, just a single message that's being tested um, or a, a whole sequence of, uh, of messages. So maybe, um, some customers are getting a brand heritage welcome series, whereas others are getting a, a brand value proposition or new arrivals type of welcome series. Um, that's great. It's uh, not terribly surprising um, to see 
The, the second most common option is all customers receiving the same welcome series. That it's a very common approach that we see. Encouraging and exciting to see some product recommendation and implementation as well. Um, okay, Maddie, why don't you flip it back to me and I'll show you a little bit about the world that we see. Okay, so we talked a little bit about um, the importance of starting with a, a clear view of who our different customer segments are. And the approach that I recommended was um, persona clustering, um, a great way of understanding behavioral, uh, demographic, and, and attitudinal differences within the customer base. Here's why this is so important when we think about reducing the flood. Again, kind of um, taking tactical steps to convert more one-time buyers into repeat customers. The um, majority of uh, brands that, that we work with fall into the same pattern as what we saw from the poll responses. Um, typically, the, um, the welcome series that goes out to customers um, is either a one-size-fits-all um, approach, so everybody gets the exact same sequence of touches, or it's um, A-B tested or, or multivariate tested, but still not truly personalized. Right? And so the example that I gave was, hey, we're testing our brand heritage against new arrivals messages. Um, people are getting kind of randomly assigned to figure out which of those performs better overall. Here's what we would recommend as um, a, a quick and relatively easy way to improve very significantly the performance of a post-purchase welcome series. Think about, rather than a one-size-fits-all or kind of the optimal welcome series, what the most meaningful set of touch points and messages would look like for each of your personas. For example, if we have our head to toe fashionista, somebody who values um, the, the curation and editorial content, the fact that we have a strong point of view on, uh, on looks, maybe we would wanna talk to her um, in, in more of an editorial fashion, right? So highlight, uh, maybe even shine a spotlight on, on some of our editors um, or designers, give her insight into the design process, talk about new designers that, that we're discovering. In contrast, if we have a persona that's much more price point focused and, and discount um, focused, we, we might wanna talk to her a little bit more about the, um, the quality of the deals that, that we offer, right? How sharp our pricing is um, relative to, to competitors, more of a promotional cadence. In fact, we can use a lot of information about our personas like what channels they tend to hang out on, how much they're, they tend to be worth from a CLV perspective to actually figure out not just an email, but what a truly cross-channel set of touch points might look like for them. For example, if we know that our head-to-toe fashionista is far and away the most valuable persona, it might be worth investing not just in a set of email touch points highlighting an editorial um, fashion story, but potentially uh, Facebook custom audiences, um, targeting, through display, as we've seen with one of our retail partners, investing in a direct mail piece, um, kind of a, um, a tactile brand impression to, to help reinforce the message. All of this we would classify as a, a relatively straightforward exercise in going from a one-size-fits-all post-purchase series to something that's much more um, personalized and, and relevant once we know the contours of our customer base. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about once we understand who our customers are, how do we think about constructing the dams? Um, so you folks indicated early on that the relevance of, of marketing isn't always the most um, significant determinant of whether you're going to go on to make a repeat purchase. Um, let's adopt that perspective as we think about coming up with a plan, a proactive action plan for each of our personas. For example, imagine that you had at your fingertips like a dossier on each of your different personas. We're going with a, a sock retailer here as our example. So we know that for um, one of our, our personas, somebody who tends to buy flashy things, show off Sam, um, really focus on logo merchandise, very status driven, um, we're, we're instantly able to zoom into which products are um, driving higher and lower repeat purchase engagement for this persona. Um, which channels are bringing in the repeat versions of Show Off Sam versus the, the one to two time buyer versions of, of Show Off Sam and, and, and so forth. Um, you could even imagine, I'm gonna skip the poll here and I'll just uh, mention this as a follow up, um, that um, we're able to do a, a deep dive, right? 
So for Show Off Sam, we saw that there are certain categories of products that are um, driving uh, less repeat rate than the average for this persona. What if we were actually able to double click further and see like the price point of those products? All of this would be enable us to um, come up with an incredibly rich merchandising plan for each of our personas. We would know exactly what products are hitting the mark, what products are falling short, where we need to bulk up our assortment um, from a price point perspective. From a marketing perspective, what are the stories that we should be focused on communicating when we talk to Show Off Sam? For example, um, because he's a show off, perhaps we would wanna actually highlight pricier sock options, um, which tend to lead to a higher repeat rate, whereas we see uh, a lot more drop off when we talk about lower price point options within these categories. These are the types of insights that, that would enable us in a very proactive way to think through how we can systematically convert more customers from each of these personas. Just to share a, a quick case study here, um, based on a, an actual omnichannel retailer that we, um, that we worked with, they uh, noticed an overall increase year over year in one-time buyers. Now, this retailer um, is, is a, a women's wear retailer primarily, and um, they had a, a core segment of knit top devotees. Think of this as one of their core personas. Um, this set of, uh, set of customers had a very distinctive demographic skew, geographically clustered um, in certain parts of the country. Um, uh, relatively price insensitive and, and brand loyal. And um, and so it was quite surprising to them when they saw a, a drop off in um, this historically very loyal segment. In fact, going through exactly the exercise that I had just described, um, where they uh, dug into the, the products um, and, and product specifications that were leading to a, a lower than expected repeat rate for this segment, um, they discovered something fascinating. Specifically, they were able to quantitatively see that um, customers from this persona who came in buying um, their signature product in, in a couple of new uh, color categories were showing um, a very significant drop off. So they were not repeating at the rate that was expected. In researching this problem, um, they actually did some qualitative research and discovered that um, uh, around the same time that they introduced some of these new colors to, to their line, they started working with a new um, upstream supplier. And um, these loyal knit top customers were reporting um, like a much higher volume of fabrication issues. So quality of the fabric, fit, um, and, and so forth, durability. Um, using these insights, the, the retailer was able to very quickly make some, some changes. Um, specifically, they were able to work with their, their supplier to ameliorate the, um, the uh, dye issue by selecting alternative um, color solutions. They were able to swap in um, new fabrics and, and new fabrication techniques uh, in time for the, the next season. Uh, and they immediately saw a, a reversal in, in the one and done decline for that segment once they fixed some of these, these product issues. Um, this is a, a great case study because there just happened to be some very obvious smoking guns that were, that were somewhat evident in, in the data. More often than not, when we work with retailers, we see by looking at their customer base through the lens of these key um, persona segments and then kind of drilling down to root cause what's driving changes in one to two time behavior. Um, where do we expect to see them repeating more than they are? Uh, it can lead to these sorts of insights. Now, imagine that we go through an exercise like this, right? We're um, able to basically sequence the genome of our customer base, and for each of our segments, we understand exactly where the opportunities are um, from a, a, a channel perspective, a product perspective, a promotion perspective. This would actually enable us to come up with a coherent shared strategic roadmap across all our teams. So maybe we know for this fictional retailer, um, that we need to put a, a new one to two time buyer post-purchase series in place for Show Off Sam. That's on the marketing team. We need to come up with the creative and the messages uh, and, and start automating those across channels. The product team is gonna be focused on fixing um, design and fabrication issues for this persona. Uh, the channel team is gonna be focused on 
de-emphasizing channels that bring in the one and done versions of uh, show off SAM versus the repeat version and, and so forth. Getting to this stage is, is typically um, incredibly eye-opening for a company. This is where the wheels really start to turn um, and, and companies begin making meaningful progress against the goal. Implementation um, is the, the next stage. So assuming that we've aligned as a company on where there's the biggest opportunity in, in our customer base, we've quantified the size of the prize, we've set a goal, we've sequenced the genome of our customer base to understand who our personas are, we've drilled into kind of strategic opportunities to improve the experience for each of them. Now we're in the implementation phase, which is actually doing the work. We've talked a little bit about, um, from the marketing perspective, the anatomy of a, a post-purchase experience. Just to give you a sense of, of what it takes typically to um, go from practice, strategy to practice or theory to practice here, uh, I wanted to call out a, a couple of things that have, have been a bit implicit in how we're talking about this. Number one, if we're going to put in place a, a personalized um, post-purchase series, something that um, basically talks to individual customers about the products, the value proposition, the, the uh, brand tone and, and vision that's unique to, to them, we obviously need to have all of our data unified and stitched together so that we can know what they're buying, whether it's online or in store. We need to know who they are from a, a channel and, and price point perspective typically predictive analytics, so having um, the, the ability in-house to run models on these customers or working with an external vendor to do so, um, it can help us very quickly determine when a customer makes her very first purchase, hey, is this somebody who's likely to be more of that head-to-toe fashionista or the accessories junkie based on look-alike customers within the customer base and everything we know about her. Um, the marketing team um, obviously needs to um, be able to access insights on who these customers are. So what should we be talking to our different customer segments about? What are the products that are most likely to resonate with them? What price points and, and value propositions? Who are they demographically? What models should we feature in the post-purchase series? These are all um, really important questions to answer as we think about putting one of these um, uh, programs in place. Now I talked about how a customer makes her first purchase. We instantly are able to decision um, by having unified data and running predictive analytics. Is this a head-to-toe fashionista or an accessories junkie? We know how to communicate to each of them based on insights about what they care about. Um, actually being able to seamlessly deploy messages across multiple channels requires that we can send information on our new customer to uh, our email service provider. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, the retailer working with Facebook custom audiences and, and direct mail. So obviously that's, that's a big part of it. And then um, I just want to emphasize, since it, it really delighted me to see how many folks are already engaging in some sort of, sort of uh, A-B testing, that having a more personalized um, post-purchase series is not a substitute for A-B testing. Um, understanding who our customers are gives us some good hypotheses about how to reach them, but um, what's the, the optimal sequence of those messages? Um, do we email three times before we reach out with direct mail? How many touches should be part of the welcome series? These are all things that no amount of analysis um, can, can answer for us before we actually get things out in the market and start testing them. And so having a, um, the capability to do some A-B or multivariate testing around different post-purchase cadences is really essential. Now, um, the post-purchase uh, welcome series is, uh, again, kind of the, the, um, the lowest hanging fruit. It's a, a pretty um, effective, reactive way to boost one to two time buyer um, conversion. But we talked about all of these other ways, not to mention the things that merchandising is due to, doing to their product assortment, financing is doing to promotion planning and so forth. Um, even within, within the realm of marketing, uh, ways that we can deliver overall just a better experience that maximizes the likelihood of uh, a customer making her second purchase. For example, imagine if uh, one of our new customers, somebody who's just made a purchase, calls up customer care to uh, find out about the status of her order or report an issue. How different of a conversation would it be if the customer care representative had at her fingertips every insight about that customer? how to talk to her, uh, what product is likely to resonate with her next, what price point is best for her. That would very significantly increase the likelihood of, of uh, her making a second purchase. 
Same thing with site personalization. A one-time buyer comes back to the site for a second time. We should roll out the carpet <laughs> with personalized messaging um, that reflects what we know about her. Um, even going so far as display advertising, um, when we retarget these customers or for store customers, target them on the open web, using what we know about who they are and what's likely to, to drive them to that second purchase um, has a very significant um, impact outside of the kind of triggered welcome series in driving one to two time buyer conversion. Just to give you a quick case study here, um, a flower company that, that we work with, um, realized that converting one to two time buyers was not only a huge business priority for them, but uh, that they were sitting on a, a, a great hypothesis about how to do so. Specifically, um, because they're sending flowers on such important sensitive occasions, Mother's Day, um, birthdays, um, grievance, um, it tends to be a, a very high touch relationship with their customers. Customers often call in to place orders, to check on the status of, of orders. Um, and previously, their customer care um, was was not really leveraging any personalized information about who those customers are and, and how to talk to them. Using Kasora, they were able to uh, basically tease out insights on who their key customer segments are, who are those personas, um, and, and actually push those insights into their call center. Um, they went through an exercise of educating their customer service representatives and of scripting up what a flow would look like that was much more personalized based on what they knew about a customer calling in um, and, and how to respectfully kind of um, provide a consultative guidance on um, the next product that might be of interest or the next occasion that the customer might not be thinking of that, that they should already be planning for. And they saw a, an immediate uptick in one to two time buyer conversion. We talked a little bit about getting other teams um, involved from a strategy planning perspective. Here's what this might look like in action. So while marketing is busy setting up a post-purchase cultivation series and kind of generally up-leveling personalization across all marketing touch points, um, our digital team or channel team might be focused on um, optimizing uh, the channels that we work with based on one to two time buyer conversion. So if our most valuable persona is um, currently being, um, uh, uh, we're currently seeing that um, the, the subset of those customers who come through certain channels, um, let's say are making uh, lower than expected repeat purchases, that might actually lead us to decrease our monthly budget for that channel. We've worked with teams that have uh, cut spend in channels altogether when they see that their priority personas um, don't tend to um, uh, view those as a one to two time buyer. Uh, opportunity or important channel for those customers. We've worked with retailers that have significantly expanded the types of channels, um, particularly direct mail for some reason keeps popping um, as a, a big growth opportunity once they see the impact that it has on, on driving one to two time buyer conversion. Um, we talked a little bit about um, what types of actions the merchandising team might be making. Um, just to give you a, a quick uh, example of what this looks like in action. When we worked with a, an omni-channel uh, retailer who again went through this flow of um, uh, identifying who their customer personas were, um, they were really, really surprised them when they saw that head-to-toe customers, um, so really um, uh, that was one of the personas that they were working with was a customer who viewed them as a one-stop shop for all of their fashion needs. Um, uh, that they um, were seeing a, a very low repeat rate amongst that persona from a collection of products that was explicitly intended to be like a capsule collection, right? So these were products that were intended to be bought together. Uh, the team had invested a bunch in shooting models in head to toe looks and, and so forth. Um, and as they did a deep dive into the products that were um, not serving as the intended gateways, what they realized was they had Kind of envisioned this as a, a, a capsule collection, but it wasn't being designed for a single cohesive customer target group. There were vast disparities in terms of like level of income um, that, that was being targeted. Um, the types of fabrications, even basic design um, was, was really different throughout this, this capsule collection because the designers didn't have a clear idea of, of who this customer were, who this customer group was. And so using insights from Kasura, they were actually able to hand off basically a design brief to the, the team that was working on this capsule collection so that they could 
um, de-emphasize or remove certain um, portions of the assortment that were off-brand. They could bring in new types of products that weren't uh, initially envisioned as the capsule collection. Overall, just create a tighter merchandise assortment. And once they began rolling that out, they, they saw a tremendous uptick in the uh, one to two time buyer rate for this head to toe look and a much greater rate of cross sell amongst the capsule collection that was intended to be shopped together. Now, the, the last piece, and I'm gonna go quickly through this because we have such a data-driven um, uh, group of folks on, on the phone here is evidenced by the fact that almost everybody's doing A-B testing is continuous measurement and, and optimization. Um, I would, it would be very disingenuous for me to claim that Kasora or any other um, analytics provider, no matter how sophisticated or um, predictive in nature, would be able to provide a, a silver bullet on um, how to fix these problems with 100% certainty. Marketing is a blend of, of art and science. And so as we're thinking about um, what's the, the right way to personalize our customer service scripting, um, right? So that we strike the right balance between helpful and consultative, but also driving one to two time buyer conversion. What's the right sequencing of messaging um, and, and the right channels to reach out to uh, uh, as we put in place a post-purchase welcome series. Um, as we begin experimenting with emphasizing or de-emphasizing certain channels based on how they contribute to the one to two time buyer rate, how much money should we reduce from low performing channels? These are all things that, that require a strong um, testing mindset and continuous measurement and optimization. Um, for us, the, the thing that we always look for when we work with retailers as a sure sign that they're gonna be able to nail these is um, are they reporting back regularly in a way that's visible throughout the organization? Um, how all of these efforts are laddering up to that goal that they set in the very beginning. So we said that we wanted to increase our one to two time buyer rate from 10 to 12 percent. Um, our marketing emails are getting us from 10 to 10.5 percent. Overall personalization is getting us from 10.5 to 10.9 percent. Merch assortment is getting us from 10.9 to 11.3. Having that level of um, granularity into the contribution of each of these different strategic work streams is, is really essential um, for continuously optimizing. And so just to um, quickly recap some of the, the key big ideas here, I think probably the most controversial um, thesis uh, here, controversial only because we work primarily with marketing teams um, and um, and, and we've seen great success with marketing teams in implementing steps to close the gap on one to two time buyer uh, behavior is just the, I think, very common sense assertion that customer loyalty is complicated, right? And it hinges on a lot more than just marketing. Marketing is in a great position as the, the team that sits the closest to our customer insights, that owns the customer relationship at being an advocate and, and a force of change throughout the organization for how, um, all of the other experiences that ladder up to customer loyalty, product, pricing, channel, customer service, um, how those can be optimized around uh, our, our repeat buyers. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a team effort that requires some coordination and shared view of where we're going. We talked about using customer insights to root cause where we're seeing drop-offs. We introduced a, uh, a, a simple framework that can be adopted by almost every retail organization, starting with who our key um, customer personas are, and then kind of heat mapping where we're seeing um, drop off uh, through the lens of those customer segments. Um, and then thirdly, it's, uh, while there's no silver bullet and certainly no piece of technology that can um, get organizations from that 10 to 15% uh, repeat rate, there is a, a rinse and repeat process that the best in class retailers we work with are, are following every day. It's actually personally very um, inspirational to me getting the chance to work with these retailers and seeing how um, despite all the ways in which retail is complicated right there are channel silos team silos um, territorialism implementing this four-step process really helps to cut through the noise and, and drive um, focus especially at the executive leadership level and alignment around these challenges I want to end the, the scripted portion of today with an unusual for Kostora call to action. Um, we are on the brink of rolling out a tremendously large product release, the biggest product release that we've ever unveiled um, in, in my six and a half years at Kostora, certainly. 
you'll hear much more about what this product release entails. Many of the themes that we've highlighted on the webinar today, opportunity sizing, benchmarking, goal setting, root causing, um, execution across teams outside of marketing, uh, closed loop visibility into what's moving the needle. Um, that, that's been very um, influential for us over the past few months as we've designed this, this new release. Um, but so we're, we're really enthusiastic about these themes right now. And we, we want to try something new, um, which is a, a simple, no strings attached opportunity for anybody um, who's not working with Kastora currently, um, which is, um, let's see what this looks like in practice. Um, with just a small slice of your data, either um, your actual individual customer level data or some basic KPIs that I would wager most folks on the phone have, have access to, Kastora can actually go through the first few steps of this cycle with you, um, providing guidance along the way. So where are there the biggest pockets of opportunity when we look at your customer base? How do you stack up against your competitive set? So similar retailers in terms of vertical and, and size um, and, and business model, um, what would be a reasonable goal given the constraints that your organization is facing? Um, and then when we, we look at the personas for your organization, um, what would be some of the, the root causes of uh, one to two time buyer challenge in, in the um, action items that we'd recommend? Think of this as basically culminating in the strategy roadmap that we looked at earlier for your team. We're so excited about this um, that, the, again, this is literally a no strings attached offer. And our hope is that um, uh, this will uh, provide some standalone value to your organization, whether or not you choose to work with Kasora um, on a move forward basis. So with that in mind, I know we're running a little bit up on time here. Maddie, do we have a, a question or two um, from the audience? And Thank you, Jordan. Yeah. Um, I know we only have a couple Let's of minutes. Let's flip over to questions, Q&A. So the first question that came in was, how do you bucket people into personas with any confidence after only one purchase? That's a great question. Um, it's, uh, it's a real challenge. Um, this is why, um, in our experience, I think the the term persona can be somewhat misleading and maybe like not in our best interest to use it when we're talking to a group of marketers. Um, in our experience, when we talk to marketing teams that are have gone through traditional persona exercises, maybe hired a fancy consulting company to come in and tell them who their personas are, they tend to think of highly qualitative personas um, and purely qualitative personas. Now, if we're operating in a world in which, and, and there's definite value in those, right? Those can serve as a true north for kind of a company in figuring out who our customers are broadly, who we should be um, thinking of as our design targets, and, and who, what types of models we should be shooting for our catalogs and creative and so forth. But it's actually really, really difficult to use those as a decision tool, especially when a customer has made only one purchase. This is why when, when we think about implementing a, a form of customer segmentation personas, we're looking for um, behavioral drivers. So uh, uh, what are the, the types of products that um, similar customers buy? How much do they tend to spend? What channels do they come through? Um, that, that is behavior that's all observable from a customer as of the, the first purchase that they make. I talked a little bit about lookalike modeling, which is just a fancy way of saying leveraging things we know about a new customer to see what existing customers they look like. But let's say that we see a brand new customer who comes in buying a handbag through the affiliate channel, um, spending about $300 on her first order. Assuming that we have some, some good stats on what typical behavior for each of our personas, we can actually say, knowing just a few data points on her, hey, does she look most like Persona A, B, D, or E. And so the two things that I would um, leave is bullet points there are number one, uh, certainly it's helpful to prioritize behavior or segmentation, behavior clustering um, alongside qualitative. It's much easier to fit people into a category as their first purchase. Secondly, adopt the mindset of um, kind of lookalike modeling, even if it's basic. So um, for any given customer, what are the things we know about them um, from their first purchase? And how can we use that to figure out which of a, a finite set of personas they're most likely to, to resemble? 
Great, thank you so much. Um, so we're out of time, unfortunately, but we will follow up um, with everyone via email who did ask a question. And as always, we'll be sending out the recording later this afternoon. Um, thank you so much, Jordan, and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Maddie, and thank you all for joining as well. Have a great rest of your day.